Thank you so very much for that kind introduction. Um, the hooping and hollering is from one of my colleagues, uh, Carson. And uh, so I very much appreciate the warm welcome. Uh, so yeah, to, uh, to start off, I am a huge Disney file. Uh, I absolutely love anything and everything Disney. I have a Disney tattoo on my arm, a little hidden Mickey. And I do actually have the, uh, the chorus from Pinocchio from When You Wish Upon a Star uh, tattooed on my wrist. So uh, I am your true Disney dork. Uh, but today I'm not here to talk to you about Disney. Uh, I'm here to talk to you guys about Canvas and qualitative research design. How excited are you guys? Oh, yeah, okay. I like it. Okay, so my presentation is going to take a little bit more of an alternative approach. Uh, for those of you guys that are more traditionalists when it comes to presentations, every one of my slides at the bottom has the same link to it. Uh, it is a short link that you can actually download my speaker notes for my presentation. Uh, my presentation is actually all graphic. Uh, main reason is I always find when I am in a presentation, I end up spending more time reading the slides and actually listening to what's going on. So uh, it's a, a couple of funny memes. I hope you get a good chuckle out of it. But yeah, you're welcome to download the slides there uh, if you'd like a copy for your notes. Yep. Is it SFU? Correct. Uh, it is get, as in G-E-T, dot S-F-U for Simon Fraser University, dot C-A, forward slash Z or Z on this side of the border, capital T, O as in Oxford, N as in November, P as in Pinocchio, I know that's pop on the phonetic alphabet, but I like Pinocchio better. And U as in uniform. All right, and that should just down, that should take you to Google Drive, and then you should be able to view speaker notes there. All right. So, who here loves teaching research methods? A couple of you guys. Great. Well, you'll find your students don't always feel the same way. <laughs> So uh, what I have, uh, so in my role at the university, I work as a learning technology specialist. And in our role, we actually uh, uh, work with our faculty at the university and help them come up with new and refreshing ways to deliver their course content. A lot of times, uh, that means we are actually taking face-to-face -face courses and helping them make it blended, or sometimes making them fully online. And about three years ago, we started making the transition over from WebCT to Canvas, which is why I'm lucky enough to be here today. So in that transition, they actually developed my team, uh, which is myself and three other learning technology specialists. And we are each assigned a number of faculties. And we spend our days roaming around campus, setting up appointments, and talking to people about what we can do to kind of invigorate things. So when I had my meeting with uh, Dr. Frederick Lesage, who is uh, one of our communication uh, faculty members who teach us research methods quite often, uh, I asked him this question. Why does qualitative research methods suck so much? <laughs> and, you know, it's, he, he got a good chuckle out of it, which is what's important. Um, he said uh, that what his students told him is more often than not, they see research methods as confusing. They don't understand, especially qualitative. Quantitative research methods is normally pretty easy to wrap your mind around. You ask questions, you collect data, you process that data, you get numerical information to come out of it, and then you can present that information and say, here's my findings numerically, and this is why it makes sense. Other students said it's too ethereal, it's too touchy-feely, it's too out there. There's no, there's no glue that keeps it all together. There are no hard numbers, at least not at the beginning. So uh, that introduces the idea of coding. Now, coding is a fun part of qualitative research because you get to code, get to do some more coding, and then finally finish it off with some more coding. <laughs> and if you, if you are not 100% on your game, not running on eight shots of Starbucks, and you mess up your coding, you will hate your life. So uh, the last thing that one of the students had told them was the class is boring. I don't like coming to class because it's boring. It's not interesting. So I asked them, well, what are your current, quote, boring approaches? Oh, sorry, I'm a little misaligned there. So we talked, to, we talked a little bit about where he came from. And the language that I used in the conversation was what I like to call the dark ages, or pre-Canvas. Uh, can it be PC? Yeah, I think so, PC, pre-Canvas. 
So uh, effectively what we had was students were required to use locally implemented tools. Now I'll give you guys a little bit of background behind that. So in Vancouver, uh, which is where we're at, uh, we're in the province of British Columbia, which is in Canada, which is just north of Washington State. A lot of people go, okay, why are you telling me that? Well, still, sometimes it's helpful because somebody once argued with me that British Columbia is in South America. Okay. Anyway, so um, in British Columbia, we have this lovely piece of legislation that's called the Freedom of Information Privacy Protection Act, and effectively says, we as a province will go out of our way to protect your data and your information, whatever that is. And my colleague Carson is probably just like groaning in his chair because he was hoping that he can at least spend three days to not hear about FIPA, because every single conversation in our university is about the Freedom of Information Privacy Protection Act. So uh, we were limited to the tools that we could use to really only things that were installed locally on our home servers. This, it found that the tool that we ended up using uh, was Web Survey, which you guys probably have had old installations of Web Survey maybe like 10, 15 years ago at your institution. We were using that until about two years ago, and it is actually still live. Um, so some people do still use it. But Web Survey makes it very difficult to share content. There's no shared question banks in between uh, students, at least not the way Canvas can do it. So what ended up happening is as students are starting to create these, uh, these questions they were asking and they're starting to think of things to, to design their research with, the TA or instructor would spend hours and hours collapsing all of the surveys because students would share their survey with them and then if you had 90 students, the TA would spend all of that time literally copying and pasting the surveys. Uh, and it was a very, very, very time-consuming uh, process. It was also very low in student engagement the courses had very low evaluation scores, and thus, you can all see, can come to the conclusion, we had issues with attendance in the class as well. Why am I gonna come to this class if it's not gonna dazzle me? Well, the question that I said is how can we reinvigorate research methods? Students seem to be uh, responding quite well to quantitative research methods. So the approach that uh, I ended up, or we ended up coming up with, uh, was a, a idea that uh, you guys have probably read about for called qualitative exploration. So it effectively, the idea that we came up for this class is to teach quantitative, I have to watch my words carefully, to teach quantitative research methods, no, qualitative research methods. We went, uh, went and dipped a little bit into qualitative approaches. So we, the, what we designed for this course was a two-tiered research approach. We led with the qualitative research design asking a couple open-ended question to figure out a direction for where we're going, to kind of get an idea for what the goal of our research is, to come up with initial findings. And because we're only asking a couple of small questions, it made it fairly easy to code. So that kind of gave students an idea of how to get their hands into it. And then we kind of finished off with a little bit of qualitative. You know, you kind of put a little sugar on the medicine just to say, so this is the, this is the, the challenging piece that we're gonna do, and we're gonna give you a little bit something a little easier. For those of you guys that are uh, kind of coming in, uh, welcome. Just so you know, I do have the speaker notes that I'm reading off of here uh, linked on the bottom of the screen. So you're welcome to download them if you'd like a copy personally. Uh, my presentation is purely graphic, uh, but you're welcome to get a copy for yourself. Um, so effectively what this approach would do is you, could, would under, uh, you would uncover underlying factors using qualitative exploration. You would ask those few open-ended questions, then you could isolate your research focus and decide if you want to do the quantitative route and whether it is actually going to, to do what you need it to do. So the approach that we took, there we go there. Uh, so that's kind of what our, oh, yeah, there we go. It's kind of the, uh, the approach that we took and the way our students looked at us. So I added Chris Pratt here just because I saw Jurassic Park over the weekend and it made me chuckle because um, I do love Andy and Parks and Recreation. So if you think about educational theory and just general educational approaches, what is the best way to become fluent in knowledge? Well, you can read about it, you can hear about it, you can write about it, it's pretty standard approaches, or you can experience it. And that's the approach we took. We took the experiential learning approach and said, you know what, we're gonna take our students and we're gonna throw them headfirst into this idea. We're gonna have them really get their hands dirty in designing research, and we're actually gonna have them teach it. We're gonna have them do it themselves. Because the best way to learn something is to teach it. 
So uh, what we did is we created, and I'll explain the approach that we took, but we took the students and we put them in the teacher role in Canvas. Now that probably makes quite a few people nervous because, well, what, all, what are the implications of that? Well, effectively what we had the students do is first we had them design their research, then they got to test their own surveys, they got to deploy their surveys, and then they got to analyze their data. Still a pretty standard approach for teaching research methods, but the angle that we took to it uh, was a little bit more unorthodox because we made them teachers. So the uh, faculty members that I worked with, now this is not so much a funny slide as, a, just an, as an informative one, uh, so the lead faculty member was Dr. Frederick Lesage. Um, he is in the School of Communications at Simon Fraser University, an absolutely fantastic guy. And he and I immediately bonded because in our university, he and I are the only two ways with the Dutch way of spelling Frederick. So F-R-E-D-E-R-I-K, no C. Uh, I also hold a little bit of a grudge because he is the one that got Frederick at SFU.ca. So if he ever retires, that's going to be my email. Um, it is in Canada. And that was his uh, PhD student that was working with us, uh, Christopher Jeselnik. Now, I'm just kidding. Canada is not white and snowy. If you've ever been there, it is in some places, but not always. That's our campus. Uh, we're fortunate enough to work on a beautiful, what is called Burnaby Mountain, just outside of Metro Vancouver. And the weather is gorgeous. Uh, it's about 70 degrees most of the time in the summer. Uh, winter time doesn't really get below 50. A little bit of rain here and there. But overall, it's a fantastic place to be. So. Um, the class that we worked on was Communications 260. It is Empirical Communication Research Methods is the official title of the class. It has about 90 students per offering, so that's you know, quite a handful. Uh, and there's a significant wait list for students trying to get into this class. It is offered in both the fall and the spring terms, and we recently started doing a summer offering for it as well because so many, so many students need this as a prerequisite to move forward in their next session. Well, when I say Simon Fraser University, more often than not, especially with uh, people who work within structure, they go, oh, you're SFU. So there's a fun story behind that. Because of Freedom of Information, Privacy, and Protection Act, we have an open source installation of Canvas. Now, our open source installation means we are not using the Canvas cloud like most of you guys are in the room. We had to install Canvas locally, we manage it locally, and it's all run on our own servers. That is so that we can meet the needs of uh, the Freedom of Information, Privacy, and Protection Act. Because the moment that we take student information and we store it south of the 49th parallel, or even outside of British Columbia, we get in very, very, very deep water. So uh, the approach that we took is to install everything locally and manage everything locally. So it gives us a little bit more flexibility in what we can do within the institution. So we uh, built, so we have two different, or three different main types of courses that you may hear me reference. We have what are called calendar courses non-calendar courses, and sandboxes. Your calendar courses are the ones that are actually linked to the student information system. That's the one that automatically gets populated with students. Then you can create, create non-calendar courses. They're non-term specific, and they're not enrollment based. So you have to manually put your students in. Exact same shell, but it's just you have to manually put your, your individuals in there. And then we have our sandbox courses, which is just the way it sounds. It's a, it's a play space. It's really that you can get your hands dirty, there's, no, there's nobody going to be in there unless you put somebody in there. It's just sort of to kind of see where things are at. The, so the questions that I got, of course, from Dr. Lesage when we started this, and the question that I get most frequently when I talk about this is, how are students enrolled as a teacher? How do you get this past you know, the, uh, the registrar's office to say, hey, we're going to need you to put all these students in as teachers? Are they automatically enrolled as teachers? That's an administrative nightmare. Uh, it's really not. Uh, can they change their own grades? If you're going to put them in as a teacher, can they change their own grades? Can they modify things? What if they delete my course? Yeah? That's a good question. Uh, what if they conclude the course? You know, it, people get very, very nervous around that. And then uh, the final one is because these questions are often left unanswered, the thing that comes out is my department would never agree to that. Just let's not worry. My department, they wouldn't go for it. But still, how? So what we did is we have three different areas. We have what's called the classroom, the lab, and the office. It's kind of the terms that we use to, to distinguish where. So the screenshot that I have here for you is actually what's called the classroom. It is the official course shell. And that's sort of where your more mundane, everyday things are. Uh, it's going to be where you keep your readings, your assignments, submissions, your grade book, announcements, all of that. 
Because it is what's considered a calendar course, you create it, it's linked to the student information system, boom, all your students come in as students. It's what we're all familiar with in Canvas. Works beautifully, it's great. The approach that we took though, is we created the second shell that we called the lab. And the lab is where we put students in as teachers. So we created a non-calendar course, a second shell, has all of the rights and privileges of a normal Canvas shell, but all the students are teachers. Well, the first kind of thing that we ran into was we were setting this up for a fall term. We were doing it in July, and we said, oh, here's our class list. We're going to download it. We're going to copy it. We're going to add everybody manually. And all of a sudden, people start changing things and playing around and clicking buttons. And I was like, no, no, it's not published. It's not published. They shouldn't see it. Well, they're teachers. When you're teachers, <laughs> they can see it. OK. Great. So that was the very, very, very first thing. So we had to like remove everybody. And then you realize that you can't actually add them until they understand why they're in the shell. So the, the lab, uh, I like to refer to as a construction zone. The construction zone is because hard hats are required. There's going to be a couple of accidents. You're going to be bumping heads. They're going to have to learn how to work collaboratively in a real world environment. For any of us that work in, uh, in higher ed and academia, you're probably very aware and uh, uh, familiar with the challenges that come in working in a research group. So if you're working with a couple of different researchers and you're trying to come up with, with research strategies and questions and things, you're going to bump heads sometimes. And sometimes people are going to delete your questions. And sometimes people are going to change things that you're very attached to. So all of a sudden, it took the, the let's design research in a small group environment of two to three students to we now have to collaborate with, we have to keep the, the general research goals of a group of 90 individuals in mind, but we have to work on smaller group uh, dynamics as well. So we broke the students out into smaller groups. So all of these groups sort of got a, a uh, focus on their questions, on sort of what you were trying to ask and how you were trying to ask it. And then uh, they, they got to working in the shell. Well, that's a lot of shells. So we're already at two shells. So now we're bringing in our third shell. So the third shell is what I like to call the office, or we just use it as a sandbox course. The office is where you, just like your office in uh, academia, your office is where generally you try to keep your sanity. That's where you keep your backups of things. That's where you keep your notes. That's where you keep all sorts of fun things like that. So that's exactly what this is. The office is a space that's used for teachers, for instructors, and TAs only. And it's mostly act as a space for backups. Backups are great things. So uh, one of the things that is extremely important throughout this whole process is to back up the questions as the students are creating them. So what's happening in these labs, like in these lab shells, the students are using the quiz tool to create new questions. Uh, they can make them open-ended questions. If they kind of wanted to focus in on a specific question, they could. So they're going to start creating all of these different quiz questions. And so the, the idea that we got how to protect people from accidentally deleting each other's things would be to, at the beginning of every class, make a backup of the quiz. At the end of the class, make a backup of the quiz. And then you come put it in your, uh, in your office space. That way, in the event that somebody says, yeah, but Judy deleted my question, and I'm so angry at her, and I'm going to throw a Starbucks on her, you say, no, 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 it's not. Um, let's take a, take a little step back here. I have a backup of the questions. It's a great way to get sort of things going. The other thing that also really works well with uh, the office is it sort of works as a uh, passing of the baton between terms. Because you want to, have, of course, have replicability in something like teaching research methods. You don't want to go completely outlandish one term and then completely outlandish a different term and not have the same educational outcomes because the university is going to get upset with you there. So because we created this uh, from scratch and you know, Dr. Lesage and I worked very hard to get the, the goals in mind and our education goals make sure we meet the needs of the university, we created this so that we can pass off between terms. So you do have banks of old terms. You can see we've got some old shells in there. Uh, and then we also have our uh, demographics because every good research uh, study has some demographic questions in there. So sometimes, you know, we, we want to have our students have sort of a tire kicker assignment at the beginning where they can try out and start making these sorts of demographic questions. But sometimes we do still need to nudge them. Even though they are in the teacher role, after all, they are still learning. They are still students. And sometimes you have to honor that because we want to take them into that stretch zone, 
but we don't want to push them into the danger zone. We don't want to make them go, oh, no, I hate this. I don't want to do this anymore. So those are our three main shells. So in uh, the lab, what, I had, what we had created was the very first thing that they did as a class, and that's actually you know, what I imagine my students look like. I have no idea what I'm doing. Uh, the first, one of the first things we did is I actually had people say, let's go ahead and create a tire kicker assignment, which is the demographic survey. Get in there, everybody knows basic demographic questions, how to move forward with it. Um, and the class got to work together as a whole, and they got to learn, uh, take this shell for a test drive and see how the tools work. If you mess up demographic questions, I have a bank that I can pull from. So that actually worked out very well. Um, you also learn uh, to teach them how they can fix their own issues. So uh, how to find and remove duplicate questions, how to isolate poorly worded questions. Because of that quiz preview function in Canvas, what it actually allowed the students to do is they can actually hit preview and go through some of the questions as a test student and see, oh, okay, this is kind of what it's going to look like. Or the question that sounded good in my head really sounds kind of crazy. So what's happening here is the students, because they're in this teacher role, because they are actually guiding their own learning, uh, the instructor and TA just kind of can help them act as barriers on the road and just kind of make sure they stay on track, but really help them design it from the get-go. And then they can actually see what happens when, they, um, when their surveys come out. So the next thing we did is design and test the surveys. So uh, in the actual design phase, uh, what we actually had to do was um, they design their questions. They decide which questions they're going to ask. They want to test drive each other's questions using that preview function. And then they're going to start moving things into question banks. So we have multiple question banks that focus on different parts of the research study. Because we're creating these groups and we're having all of the groups focus on specific areas or specific kinds of knowledge that you want to gather from this, uh, from this research study, you want to put them in question banks so that when you're actually building your survey, and this is just to help, thing, help the TA and the teacher on the other side, when you're building the survey in the main shell, uh, you can actually just pull from question banks rather than having to select multiple questions. And then deploy. This is the fun part. We migrate all the things. So this is, you know, it sounds a little, little like scary at first. So when we first tried this out in the web survey days, uh, it was very, very time consuming because there was no migrate function in web survey. You couldn't actually just bring things together into one massive survey. You had to bring over the questions individually. Well, with Canvas, because we have, you know, at the end of a, of a, of a um, creation phase, we actually have a set of about 10 question banks. So all the instructor, the TA, has to do is he has his two shells. You've got your classroom, and then you have your, your secondary shell. And then you can just say, migrate quiz these question banks into a main quiz. All of them then fell into the main shell, into the main student shell. And then the students come in on the other side as students again, and now they're taking their own research study. They all of a sudden went from becoming the researcher to the research participant. So now they get to see, well, how are my questions actually hitting me as a participant? And so because there are quite a few questions that got asked in there, uh, you know, they want, we want you to answer honestly and openly. And then uh, what we got out of it is after the students have finished their submissions as research participants, we're going to download the, uh, the submissions and then bring them back into the lab. And then we can say, OK, here's your submissions. Now go take a look to see what they look like in a CSV format. And you can actually see how things are, how the questions came together. In managing the lab itself, not too difficult. Um, all you had to do was create your groups, make frequent backups, uh, manage and create your question banks if your students didn't do it appropriately, and then put out the occasional fire, as always. That's nothing new to anybody. So what are the overall benefits at the end? The, uh, we found that from based on the evaluations, uh, we had an increased level of engagement in the course because students had a relationship with the data. They had a relationship with what they were measuring. There was increased attendance in all of the classes. The students held a, held a stake in the process. They felt like they were actually important. Be and because they were in smaller groups, they were missed if they weren't there. And they felt attended, they felt inclined to actually attend the larger class meetings as well. Because a lot of times we would pull questions out and discuss them and say, so how is this actually working? How is this looking? 
We also found that overall the students walked out with higher marks because they had a firmer understanding of the actual uh, qualitative research design. There were better course evaluations at the end because they had fun. They actually felt like they learned something. So they walked out saying, yeah, this was a worthwhile course. And there's actually less stress on the instructor. Because, of the, because the students took the majority of the work, they didn't have to manage things as quite so heavily. Uh, the instructor walked away saying, actually, I got all of these benefits, and it was a little easier in the end. That's the main things of what we did. So uh, we have a couple of extra minutes. We have about four minutes based on my timer that I'm going to throw to you guys. And where's the microphone? Oh, there it is. Does anybody have any questions for me? All right, so the question is, was my class ever reset or deleted or concluded? The only time that we had sort of a mishap was a student deleted an entire question bank. They were trying to delete a question. They deleted their entire question bank, and uh, we were able to recover it from the office, which was great. Uh, the way our installation of Canvas is set up, it is actually very difficult to delete, delete a course. Uh, you can conclude a course, and luckily we can um, email our IT services team, and they can unconclude a course. Uh, so that actually is nice because we have a local installation. But you know, the, if you have frequent backups, that's, that's good. Yes, ma'am? Did all the questions that they created all come together as one massive research question, and all the students took it? Yes. Yeah. So at the end of time, the, so we, we gave them all directions on the, and sorry, sorry, the question that was asked was, did the questions actually come out to a, a, a cohesive and coherent research study. And yes, they did. So we had 90 students in the class. And on our first deployment, we had 55 questions um, that, we were, that they were taking. Now, I can understand, of course, you're saying you know, for a, a qualitative study, 55 questions is a lot, especially if you have to code it. But um, it was sort of the, the idea you can give that to students. Well, and here's 55 questions. Now you get to go code it. And then they will never ask them any questions again. So, but yes, it, they did actually come to a nice cohesive so question. At the end, when you had them doing their own analysis mm -hmm. of that, they were analyzing the 90 people who took it. Correct. Correct. They were analyzing the N, which was 90 um, of the 55 questions to, to come up with commonalities and questions. And that would be able to put that back in the second cell so they all could see that. Correct. Data. Correct. They would download it as a, as a uh, CSV file, all of the submissions. They were two completely, the, the shells were connected, but they were two completely separate instances. Uh, but we did just link them. So you just copy that, uh, your URL, the course number, and I just created a hard link with an icon that said that is the, um, that is the lab. Yep. And one more. Yes. Yep, so the, 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 the question was, did it all happen in one semester? And yes, we did actually deploy it in the fall term. And it, this whole process actually took about nine weeks. Because for a 13-week term, you need introduction and you need the end. So it was about a nine-week process from the beginning to the actual deployment to the analysis phase. Perfect. Yes, ma'am. Uh, these were year two. The question was, what level students were they? And these were uh, year two students, so they were sophomores. Uh, so they had finished the basic introductory classes, then they were moving into um, quant and qual uh, research methods before they then do their third year um, research um, classes. You can even do something like this on a smaller scale. Absolutely. Like an intro to whatever topic they're Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, so the, my time is, is up here. So I'm going to stick around for a couple of more questions. If you'd like to leave, you're welcome to. Thank you, thank you, thank you. And then so and, you know, as you guys uh, step out, you can uh, keep in mind this was, you know, this was for research methods, but the same approach can be used on a, much on a much smaller scale in various different circumstances by giving your students a teacher role. Perfect. Well, thank you guys so much for attending. I really, really do appreciate it.